Amen. It's good to be here this evening. Amen. And I'm, I'm thankful and privileged to have one more opportunity, as the old time preachers would say, to stand behind the sacred desk Amen. and to break the bread of life. Amen. Amen. And what a privilege it is to be here tonight. And I enjoyed the good preaching already about that camel. Where's the preacher back there? There he is. Amen. That camel will get you to the other side. Amen. What a, what a blessing. And just another reminder how that God, the invisible things of God can be seen through the things that are made. And all of God's creation testifies to, to his existence and to his grace and to his desire to save sinners like you and me. Amen. And thank God for what's around us. And then that passage goes on to say, so that they're without excuse. Men are without excuse. Open your eyes and look around you and see the word of God written on a scroll of nature, of creation. And God wrote it there. And then, thank God, he wrote it in a book called the Bible. Amen. Amen. Blessed old Bible. Amen. 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 Love it. And, and, uh, in, and, uh, and uh, take it for the word of God that it is. Look with me tonight. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter number, chapter number 13. 17, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 17. Let me put my glasses on. Matthew chapter number 17. And when you find your place, stand please in reverence to the word of God. And let's, and let's just read a few verses. One, two, three, four little verses. In Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Verse number 24. And when they would come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And he saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. And Jesus said to him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take, and give unto them for me and thee. All right, you can be seated. And what we're... we're Looking at here in the word of God in these four verses, in verse number one, we're talking about the tribute money, the tribute money. And I want to share with you this evening on the miracle of the tribute money. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here this evening in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the, the good service already, for the good singing, for the good word of God that we've already heard preached. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you will touch us one more time. Yes. And, Lord, would you open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from thy law. And may, would you roll back the, the veil of heaven and give us a fresh glimpse of our yes. Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help, him to see, help us to see him better, clearer. Help us to love him more and to be determined to serve him with all our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Here in the, these four little verses in Matthew, I want to look actually at four things. You can write these down, and we'll try to, we'll try to cover these tonight. I want to look, first of all, at the power and the providence of God. I want us to see that. I want us to see the power and the providence of God. When we're reading in these verses, we see one of those Jehovah Jireh moments in the Bible. Amen where God sees ahead and provides the need before the need even arises, before the men ever came to Simon Peter's house and knocked on the door and asked him for the tax money, God already had a fish out there in the Sea of Galilee with the money in his mouth to take care of. Amen. 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 Right. And, and he's the same for you and I, isn't he? Yeah. Sissy, bring me water, if you would, please. And I'll, I'm, I'm sort of like the other preacher. I have to wet my whistle a little bit here to, to preach. 
I don't know if that's just an old, an old I'm not calling him old either, but, that's maybe, <laughs> but that may be just an old people problem. I don't know. But, but the water tastes pretty good. Amen. One of those moments when God lets you know that he already has your, your need in mind. He's taking care of it before it ever happens. Yeah. That's all. And he does that. He, yeah. One old preacher in Virginia said, you know, the Lord's bad for that. Amen. <laughs> That's exactly how he operates, isn't he? He knows what we need. He knows how to take care of it. He knows exactly how to provide it. Amen. And here's a good example of it, the power and the providence of God. I want us to see also the payment of the tribute, the payment of the tribute. Now, what was this tribute? Very quickly, very quickly, turn over to Exodus chapter 30. What was he talking about? I used to read this passage, and I, I would read those four verses, and I'd say, okay, I understand he provided the money for the tax, but there's got to be more to it than that. What was he talking about? Well, Exodus chapter 30 explains it when we understand that this tribute, and actually in the good Greek text under our King James Bible, amen, the underlying our King James Bible, if you look that up there in Matthew chapter 17, you'll find it was talking about those that came to collect the didrachmas. The di How many knows what a didrachma is? I'll be honest with you. Where I live in West Virginia, we don't use words like that. Amen. <laughs> and, so, but, and most of the time, what good Baptists do when they come to word they don't understand, they skip it and go on. <laughs> but it would help us once in a while to stop and look it up and find out what it means. A didrachma was a half a shekel. Now with that opens, the, it opens our eyes to what kind of tribute it was. The half shekel tax is described, explained at Exodus chapter number 30. Look in verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. And this they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered a half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary. Look, the verse closes by saying it will be an offering to the Lord. Verse 14, every one that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When they give, here it is again, an offering unto the Lord. But look at this, to make an atonement for your soul. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial to the children of Israel before the Lord. To make, and there it says again, to make atonement for your soul. So this tribute of a half shekel was required of every Jewish male 20 years old and older and it's called here a ransom. It's called an offering. It's referred to as atonement money and said to make an atonement for your soul. When you and I both know, and Peter makes it very clear, you're not redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ right. as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. So what's this talking about? How do we explain what this money was used for? Well, I think the answer is in verse 16. It is, yeah, thou shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Who said that already? Was it, was it preacher that preached tonight? The water is free, but you've got to pay for the pump, you know, to pump yeah. it to get it here. Yeah. You know, salvation is free, but you have to pay some money for the radio to get it out there. You've got to pay some money for a, a place to preach the word of God and, and to finance the work of God. Amen. Right. And they had to have some money to finance the work at the tabernacle so that every year there would be an atonement, to, uh, an animal to sacrifice. There would be a place to do it. There would be priests there to take care of it. Yeah, right. so, so it underwrote the service at the tabernacle. That's what it was for. And without it, there were, they couldn't operate. So it was the money they used to operate the work of God here in this world. Amen. Amen. So here we are. We're talking about they that received the tribute. These were the tax men. And we see the payment of the tribute. We understand what that is now. And then thirdly, we see the pranks of the devil. The pr did you, by the way, did you see the devil in those four verses? And you say, you mean he's there? Well, he's usually always there when God's doing something. <laughs> 
I had I had one good pastor friend. He said he was in a church and it was such a rough place that he went early on Sunday morning, opened the door, and told the devil, "Come on in, a good a good seat." While he was there, because he knew he was going to be there anyway. <laughs> no matter what God does, He's always in opposition. He's the adversary. Yes. Amen. Did you see the adversary here? You say, well, no, I didn't see him. Where's he at? Well, notice this. We're in chapter 17. Go back to verse 1. Do you know where Peter and James and John and the Lord Jesus had just come from? Yeah. It says in verse 1, After six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him, and... Then answered Peter and said, Lord, said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Jesus took these three. They went up on the mountain and got in the glory. Amen. Amen. And that's kind of what we need to do in, in church time too, isn't it? And camp meeting time, a jubilee time. Amen. We get an opportunity to go up on the mountaintop. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad for that two hump camel because for every valley there was two mountaintops. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's just how, thank God for the mountaintop. But they came down from the mountaintop, came home to Capernaum, and guess who came knocking on the door? The IRS. <laughs> That's right, the tax man. And they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Now notice... They caught Peter while he was outside. They, they caught him while he came out all to himself alone. He, he was there in the yard or in the house. He, they knocked on the door. He'd come out. They know Jesus is in there too. But they don't call him out. They call Peter out. They get him by himself. They know the master's in there. And they don't say, Peter, don't have you paid your taxes? Of course he hadn't. But they said, damn, you paid your taxes. They said, the man that's staying here, your master, you know the one they say, is a rabbi, a teacher, maybe even the Messiah. And doesn't he pay his taxes? Hasn't he paid his temple tax? Look at what Peter said. Verse number 25. He said, yes. Peter, doth not your master pay tribute? And Peter says, yes. Now the truth was Jesus hadn't paid the tax and Peter hadn't paid his tax either. And what were these men trying to do? They were trying to cast the Lord Jesus in a bad light. They were trying to make him look bad. They were trying to say to Peter, if that man is who he says he is, I mean, even if he's a good Jew, he's known the law all his life. If he's just a good Jew, he would have paid his taxes already. But why hasn't he paid his tax? They were trying to cause, cast doubt in Peter's mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see how Peter answered Peter gave Jesus the benefit of the doubt. He knows that maybe he hasn't paid them yet, but he's absolutely sure that he will. Now you say, why is that important? Well, here's why that's important, because when you're going through a bad time, <clears throat> when things are not the best, the devil's going to come around your way, hop up on your shoulder, and say bad things about Jesus to you. Look what you're going through. Look what your trouble is. Yeah. Hadn't he taken care of that? If he's who he says he is, why hadn't he already taken care of it? Uh -huh. but, the, but Jesus gave the Lord the benefit of the doubt. He said, I know he, maybe he hasn't yet, but I know he will. Amen. 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 And there's one thing I know about the Lord. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your trouble is. I don't know what your need is. But I do know one thing. He will take care of it. Amen. He will supply the need. He will take care of the problem. He will come through for you Amen. and right on time. Amen. 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 So always learn to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt. Notice the fourth thing. There's the power and the providence of God, the payment of the tribute. There's the pranks of the devil. But notice this. There is a, there's a clear picture of salvation by the grace of God. Amen. We heard a little bit about that already, didn't we? A clear picture of salvation by the grace of God. And you say, how so? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Because the Lord Jesus uses three things to paint for us a clear picture of God's salvation. What does he use? First of all, he uses a coin. 
Then he uses a fish, and then he uses a hook. And with those three simple, everyday things that everybody knew about, a coin, a fish, and a hook, in this story, he paints for us a picture of our salvation. Let's, let's look at the picture, and let's see if we can find anything to tell us about what that picture is. I think, first of all, and the easiest part in the story is the coin itself. The coin is a picture that Jesus used in the story. What do you think the coin represents in the story? I tell you, that I said it was the easiest part. Let me see. I believe I have a coin here somewhere. I believe I have a coin here somewhere. I'll show it to you. Very much like the coin that Jesus had, when, or the, very much like the coin in the story, that was in the fish's mouth. And if you look at that coin, like, just like all coins all the way back to Jesus' time and Peter's day, they had coins very much the same. And on the front of the coin, there was a man. I, I dare say on every coin you have in your pocket, on the front, there is a man. And so the coin in the story then becomes a picture of man, or really, of mankind. Of mankind. Now, let's ask some questions tonight. Jesus said, go down to the sea, cast in a hook, take up the fish, look in his mouth, you'll find a coin. I want to ask some questions. How do you think, where do you think, how do you think that fish got that coin in his mouth? How do you think it got the, the coin in his mouth? Well, let me say this. If the Lord Jesus, I believe, had wanted to, he could have caused the coin to appear in the fish's mouth. Anybody have a problem with that? Or really, if he had wanted to, he could have reached out into nothing and pulled out that coin. As a matter of fact, there was a day when he reached out into nothing and pulled out everything. Amen. 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 He could have reached into nothing and pulled out the coin. But he had the coin right where, where he wanted the fish's mouth. The fish had the coin. How do you think the fish got the coin? I'll tell you what I think. I think he found it. I think the fish found the coin. Where do you think the fish found the coin? Only place the fish could have found the coin. In the sea. That's deep theology, right? <laughs> the fish had the coin. He found the coin. How did, where did he find it? In the sea. Let's ask another question. How do you think the coin got in the sea? Now, up where, where we live uh, in West Virginia, we have, some, we have some ponds and lakes up there. But I have, and I've been there at times, but I never have seen anybody standing there pitching coins in the sea or in the pond. Never have. How do you think that coin got in the sea? Tell you what I think. I think that one time that man, that coin, that man was in the hand of another man. And either by some accident or some incident, something happened that that man dropped that coin. He, he dropped it into the sea. He lost the coin. And the man lost, dropped the coin, lost the coin. The coin was in the sea. Now the coin becomes a picture of who? Not just man, not just mankind, but of lost man. Oh. Of lost mankind. Amen. And what do you think the coin did when the man dropped it in the sea? It fell. And it, it, began, it, it fell into the sea, and it began a path downward into yeah. the sea. Amen. Yeah. The reason is because there is a physical law called gravity, which just happens to rhyme with a spiritual law called depravity. Oh, yeah. Gravity says that after a fall has taken place, that an object continues its path farther and farther and farther downward until it comes to rest on something solid. <laughs> and when the man <laughs> dropped the coin and it fell into the sea... The coin, or the lost man, began his downward path, down, 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 farther and farther down, until it reached the bottom. Can I say something about the, that one day the fate of this man on this coin, his, his fate was in the hands of another man. His fate, his future, his life, his death, his forever was in the hands of the man, that man called Adam. Our fate was in his yes. hands. And because of what happened in the garden, Adam lost us. And we fell. 
and we became, we became fallen man, and we began our downward journey into depravity, farther and farther away from God, lower and lower and lower in sin, until today I think men have gone pretty much as low as they can go, don't you? And there at the bottom of the sea, there's the muck and the mire and the yes. dirt and the grime. Yes. And that's where our world is today. Yeah. Farther and farther away from God. Amen. And there in the sea, at the bottom of the sea, the man is really at the mercy of the currents in the sea. If, if the water pushes him this way, he goes that way. If he goes that way, that way. And he's really, you know, like, a, like, a, a, like John the Baptist said, a reed shaken in the wind. It's just carried back and forth by the wind. Men today without God, they go whatever way the world goes. Yes. Whatever's the trend or the fad or the habit or the sin of the day, that's the way they go. Yes. And we see our world going and our nation going in some bad directions today. Amen. And at the bottom of the sea, the man on the coin, the lost man is carried by the currents until he gradually works his way, still following the law of gravity, farther and farther and farther and farther down until he comes to the lowest place in the sea. The lowest place in the sea, by the way, there's a good New Testament word for it, Greek word for it. It's called the abyss. The abyss is, is referred to the bottom of the sea. That's also the very same word that's translated pit, the pit. And so the man has now fallen and he's been car being carried farther and farther down, covered in the muck and the mire, and he's on his way to pit, which is n none other than hell itself. Yeah. And that's the picture we see in the coin and the man on the coin. Notice this about the coin. How many of us will agree that that man at the bottom of the sea, there's no possible way that that man can, by his own power can ever lift himself up and get himself back to where he was before he was lost. There's no way. He can't, he can't work his way back. So, so much for works. He's worth a lot, but he can't even buy his way back. There is no way that he can recover himself from his lost condition. Amen? Amen. And so the future of that man is pretty much hopeless and helpless. Yeah. But... There was a fish. A fish in that sea that actually may have even seen the man fall and watched him go all the way to the bottom. And there's one thing that we do know about that fish, and that is that that fish could swim all the way down to where the man was, down in the muck, down in the mire, down at the pit, and pick the man up and lift him up out of his fallen condition. Amen. And so the fish in the story becomes a good picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you say, you say and our, our brother talked about this, there's so many types of Christ in the Bible. And this one, though, is maybe an unusual type or picture of Christ, and that is the picture of the fish. But I believe all of us at one time or another have seen that little symbol right there, haven't we? We use it as a symbol. Christians use that. I see license plates with that on it, belt buckles, T-shirts with the fish. And did you know that early Christians used that as a symbol of their faith, used it as a symbol for Christianity, that little fish like that? Yes, they did. And so the fish is a good type or picture of Christ. The fish was the only one who could go down, find a man, pick him up. Notice something else. You've seen the fish as a picture of Christ, but... And maybe at some time you've seen that fish either with these funny-looking letters. Sometimes they're written inside. Sometimes underneath. Have you seen those before? And uh, we don't write like that in West Virginia either. But <laughs> what that is, that's the Greek word for fish. It's the very word in the text when it talks about the fish. It's the word ichthus. And ichthus means fish in Greek. But did you also know that this first Greek letter is the letter iota? And iota just happens to be, well, I guess I better show you the rest of it. Iota just happens to be the first letter of the Greek word Jesus, which is Jesus. And chi 
just happens to be the first letter of the Greek word Christos, which is Christ. Amen. And theta happens to be the first letter of the Greek word theos, which is God. Amen. And epsilon happens to be, just, you know, coincidence, just happens, happens to be. Happens to be. The first letter of the Greek word weos, which means son. And sigma over here just happens to be the first letter of the word soterios, which means Savior. And you put it together, it says, Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I believe God's in the works right there. Amen. Especially when we realize that only the fish could yeah. go down to where the lost man yeah. was yeah. and Amen. pick him up. Out of the muck and the mire. And did you know the Lord Jesus spent his earthly ministry lifting up the fallen? Yes. He reached down, he reached down to fallen man. He healed the sick and the lame, the halt, the blind, the downtrodden, the demon possessed. He lifted them up the in his lifetime on earth, in his earthly ministry. But I want to make one point really clear about, about the fish as a picture of our Savior, and he is, but not even the fish. Not even the fish. He could lift the, he could recover, find the man, recover the man, lift him up, but not even the fish could get the man back to where he was before he was lost without taking the hook. Oh. Uh -huh. The fish had to take the hook to get the man back to where he was before he was lost. And you say, what do you mean? Well, where's the man? Where's the coin? In the fish's mouth. Where's the fish? In the water. How do you get him back to land? How do you get him back to where he was before he was lost? The man. Well, you have to hook the fish and pull the fish in, don't you? And so in order to rescue the man, to get him back to where he was before he was lost, the fish had to take the hook. You know what that means, don't you? A hook is a piece of sharpened metal. By the way, I, I did a little study on fish hooks, and archaeologists have found some ancient fish hooks that were used thousands of years ago. And you know what they looked like? They looked exactly like that. <laughs> That's just the nature of it. That's just how it is. Amen. That's how it is. Let me get a drink. A fish hook is a fish hook is a fish hook. <laughs> and in order to catch the fish, the fish has to be hooked by that sharp barb on the end of that hook. The fish has to take the hook. In other words, it has to be wounded. And it has to bleed. And really, to get the fish back, you, you know, when the man, the man, the coin is rescued, what, did they tell you what happened to the fish? I think the fish actually gave his life so that that man could be rescued. And you know what the Lord Jesus did for us as our Savior? He was wounded for our transgressions. Amen. He was bruised for our iniquities. Jesus. He was pierced for you and me. Amen. In fact, the prophet Zechariah, in the prophet Zechariah, the Lord said there, and in that day they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. And we know the blood ran down, didn't it? So in order for the fish to get the man back to where he was before he was lost, the fish had to take the hook. Now here's something very interesting. How many fishermen we have? You fit, when, you, when you hook a fish, of course, you know, you feel him on the line. But sometimes he really pulls hard. And what a fish will actually do is they'll take the plunge. They'll go down. They'll go deep. And if at the bottom of the stream or the lake, if there's any rocks down there, they'll run in the ho little holes in the rocks trying to hide, trying to get away. And you know, when the Lord Jesus was pierced for us and his blood was shed for us, he took the plunge down into death. And they took his body down off the cross and they hid him away in a little hole in the rocks called the sepulcher, just beneath the brow of Mount Calvary. 
But can I remind you, and you know, that guess, you know, if you're a good fisherman, you, they let the fish put up a fight, but you're determined to get him. And can I remind you, at the other end of that line, there was a strong arm. And Peter said, you took him, the Lord of glory. You mistreated him. You slew him. You hung him on a tree. You put him in the grave. But God raised him up again. And God pulled in that fish. Amen. <laughs> when he raised his son again from the dead. Now, did, notice this. When the fish came up from the water, when Peter threw out the line, he took the hook, and the fish came up from the water, the man came with him. And the man got a free ride from the bottom <laughs> back to where he was before he was ever lost. Amen. Amen. And he owed it all to that fish. Amen. 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 Yeah. We were down in the muck and the mire. Oh, we yeah. read the Paris on our way to the pit. Amen. And then Jesus came. Hallelujah. Amen. And he shed his blood for us to get us back to where we were before we were lost. Wow. Now, did you notice, did you notice in the text in Matthew 17 what Peter used for bait? It's, it, tell, it tells what he used for bait. Look at it. What did Peter use for bait? He baited the hook. Did you know not many, pe not many fish in the Bible caught with hooks? As a fact, matter of fact, this is the only account in the Word of God of a fish that was caught with hooks. There are some mentions of fish hooks in other places, but this is the only account of a fish being caught with a hook. By the way, did you know if a fish is, is caught, what, what else did they fish with besides hooks? Nets. Most of they always fish with nets. There's something interesting about that, and that is if a fish is caught with a net, you know, here's the fish. If he's caught with a net, the net encloses him, he's pulled in. He has no choice at all in the matter, does he? Nope. But what about if a fish is caught with a hook? Can you picture that little fishy right there looking at that hook with his big eyes open, and he's trying to decide, shall I or shall I not? <laughs> Do I want to take the hook or do I not want to take the hook? And if he decides to take that hook, he does of his own choice, of his yeah. own volition. Yeah. So what? So what is this? The Lord Jesus was not forced into giving his life for you and me. He saw Calvary in all of its horror. He saw the cross in all of its shame. He saw it in all the pain that it... Yeah. He saw what the penalty of man for man's sin was for all eternity. And he had a choice in the matter. He could choose whether or not he wanted to take the hook, whether the man was worth it. Amen. Amen. And when he looked at that hook, do you notice what did you find it yet? What did he use for bait? Nothing. Go to the sea, cast in a hook. No bait, cast in the hook. The fish swam up to the hook, saw the hook. There was nothing there to attract him. There was nothing. Why do you bait a hook anyway? To attract, the, lure the fish, to deceive him, to trick him, right. <laughs> or to hide the hook so he don't know what he's doing. But Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. He was not yeah. fooled into going to the cross, not Amen. deceived there. He went there with both eyes open. Yes. I don't know why they'll do it, but a fish will bite a bare hook. I've, we've caught fish on bare hooks before. They must see something about that hook that does attract them. Maybe it's just the way the light reflects off the hook. Maybe it's just a certain thing they see in a certain way when they look at the hook. And what do you think Jesus saw that made him take a bare hook? What do you think he saw about the hook that made him think it was worth it? I'll tell you what I, I think he saw. Now, I just have to show this to you the way the Lord showed it to me. I was sitting in a restaurant one day trying, looking at that passage, and I had a napkin scratching around on it, drawing fish hooks on it. <laughs> and suddenly I saw it. And I think this is what Jesus saw when he looked at the hook. You see that hook, what letter of the alphabet does it look like? It looks like a J. You see the little top part over here where the line is tied to? Do you know what letter of the alphabet that it looks like? It looks like a O. Oh. And what about this sharp part over here? That's where all the pain is. That's the part you want to 
If you ever got one in your finger or you got one hooked, that's the part you want to stay away from. But when he looked at that, I think he saw this. Another letter of our alphabet. And I think that's what Jesus saw. Amen. Hallelujah. When he looked at the hook. When he looked at Calvary. Amen. And he said, and he looked at lost mankind. He saw a perishing world. And he said, yes, it's worth it. And we see Jesus. Who for the, with the joy set before him. Amen. Endured the cross. Amen. Despising the shame. Yes. And is set down on the right hand of God. I think, I think he saw the, the joy of seeing sinners saved. Amen. And when one sinner is saved, there's rejoicing Amen. in heaven Amen. in the presence of the angels. I think when he looked at Calvary, he saw the joy of seeing Israel finally redeemed. And that, won't be, that won't be far down the road. Amen. Amen. And when he saw Calvary, he saw the throne of David and the king in thrones. And he saw eternity with his people. And, he, and then he said, that's good enough for me. And he paid the price. And he paid it in full. Amen. 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 And so he took the hook for you and for me. Now quickly, quickly, go back to Matthew 17. I want to give you some closing thoughts. In Matthew 17. Look at the question. Does not your master pay tribute? Peter said, yes. But the truth was, he hadn't paid it yet. <laughs> Peter hadn't paid his either. Jesus hadn't paid his taxes. Here's a question I want to answer. Why hadn't Jesus paid his tribute? He was a Jew. He was 20 years and older. It was his responsibility. He knew, it. He knew the law. You know why he knew the law? <laughs> Say it again. He wrote, he wrote the law. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He knew the law. Why hadn't he paid it yet? Well, first reason, so we could get this story. <laughs> <laughs> if he'd already paid it, this story wouldn't be in the Bible. Yeah. So we could get the story. And see the beautiful picture of salvation by the grace of God. When we were lost and couldn't help ourselves, he came. Amen. There was a second reason why he hadn't paid it. Look in verse 25 and 26. Now here's what happened. The tax men came. They catch Peter out there and they said, Peter, your master, we know he's here. Doesn't he pay his taxes? And Peter says, yes. And they leave. He goes in the house. And he goes running in the, in the house to tell Jesus who's been out there and what they're up to. And when he opens his mouth to tell Jesus, Jesus says, stop, Peter. Don't say a word. Don't say a word. I know who's been out there. I know what they want. Let me ask you a question, Peter. What thinkest thou? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or strangers? And Peter said to him, Of strangers. And Jesus said unto him, Then are the children free. Now what does that mean? What are the kings of the earth when they take a custom or a tribute? By the way, this tribute was paid at the Lord's house. Who was the king that exacted, exacted that tribute? It was God himself, wasn't it? Yeah. That tax, God leveled that tax on the people. So when a king takes a tax from another people, who do they tax, their children or strangers? And Peter has no problem with that because he knows what happens when one nation conquers another. They tax all the people. And Peter says they tax strangers. And Jesus said, then are the children free. Who was the king that exacted that tax? God. Who was God? God only had one child, one son, and that was Jesus Christ then are the children free. The king's son is tax exempt. Yes. <laughs> he, didn't have, he hadn't paid it yet because he wanted to teach a lesson. And the lesson was this. He didn't know it. <laughs> because he was the father's son. He didn't owe that tax. Amen. He was free. Well, if he was free then, why did he pay it? There's a very good reason why he paid it. Look in verse 27. In verse number 27, he said, lest we offend them. Oh my. Who were they? They were the duly authorized 
officers of the, of the law, of the synagogue, that were the tax collectors. It was their right and duty to go and collect those taxes from all the men. And if he did not pay it, he would have offended the law. He would have broken the law. And if he had broken the law, he would have been a sinner and he would have been in the same boat with all the rest of us. Because James 2 and 10 says, He that offends in the least offends in the whole. You break one commandment, you've broken the whole law of God. Jesus paid it, lest we offend them. Why did he pay for Peter? Well, because Peter couldn't pay it for himself. Peter's financial situation was about the same throughout the New Testament. Silver and gold have I none. (laughs) Amen. Now, if you don't get anything else, get this. And that is that Peter had a debt that he could not pay. And Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. And you and I had a debt that we could not pay. Our sin debt was beyond our ability to pay for. But the innocent Lamb of God came down from glory, came all the way down to where we were. In fact, let's, let's let's look at one thing here. He came for us. Look at Peter. Peter's debt was paid, and that guaranteed something for Peter. Once, a ta- once he had the tax money in his hand, Peter had a debt he couldn't know. Jesus paid the, paid the debt he didn't know. Peter had the debt. Jesus paid it for him. But notice this. What did paying the tribute money guarantee for Peter? Well, it guaranteed, first of all, that there would be an atonement made. Because that's what the atonement money was all about. It would go into the treasury on the Day of Atonement. Everything would be running up and running. The sacrifice would be offered. It guaranteed an atonement for Peter. By the way, you know the coin and the fish? Where was the coin and the fish's mouth? mouth. Yeah. And, and where was the hook in the fish's mouth? And where did the fish bleed? In his mouth. And when Peter pulled that man out of that fish's mouth, he was all covered up with that fish's blood. Amen. Amen. Yes. It guaranteed there would be an atonement made for Peter in the same way. It guaranteed a second thing. And that is, did you notice when this tax was collected? Exodus 30. It was, we already read it, but it said, when thou numberest the people, when thou numberest them. It was a census tax. It was always taken at the time of the census. They numbered the people, and the people paid their taxes. And when people, Peter took those two, those, uh, that coin, that, that uh, stator or that drachma, that shekel, when he took it to the synagogue, which was where they collected the taxes, and he laid it on the counter, the clerk took his feather and he dipped it in his ink. And in the National Register, he wrote down, Simon Peter. And right out from it, he wrote, (laughs) paid in full. (laughs) Paid in full. It guaranteed that Peter would have an atonement. And it guaranteed that his name would be written in the book. And Jesus said... Don't rejoice because the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. Now, very, very quickly, let's retrace the history of that man. He began in the hand of another man. His fate was in that man's hand. That man lost him. He became fallen. He took the plunge down into the depths, farther and farther down to the bottom, the muck, the mire, hopeless, helpless, on his way to the pit. But there was a fish that saw him, came to where he was, picked him up, lifted him up, took the hook, brought him back to where he was before he was ever lost. He wound up in the hand of the fisher of men. Amen. Amen. Now Simon Peter didn't save him. He just got to reel him in. (laughs) Okay, preacher. (laughs) 
we don't get to save anybody either, but it sure is fun reeling them in, amen. <laughs> when you cast out the gospel amen. and you get to reel them in. What did Peter do with him? He took him down to the house of God. That's where he wound up. From the bottom of the sea in the muck and the mire into the house of God. Now, I don't know what you think about it, but I think that any time you get somebody gloriously saved from the muck and the mire, they'll always wind up at the house of God. Amen. 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 But the truth was, that was only the local house of God, the synagogue. In every community, every little town had a synagogue. They had a local house of God. Thank God for our local houses of God today. God does his work through the local church. Amen. 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 But that was not that man's final destination. Because when the tax period was over, the census was done, from up at the big house of God in Jerusalem, you know, the temple up there, Jesus said, my father's house, up at the big house of God, from the tax office up there, they sent out delegations of armed, armed delegations because it was, it was valuable treasure. And they sent them out to every one of the little local houses of God. And they picked up all of those little men that had been gathered in all over the kingdom. And they, under armed, the armed guard, they transferred them back to the big house. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, thank God for the local church. Thank God for the little houses. But, folks, we're on our way to the big house. Amen. 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 Now, there was only one problem with that. And the problem with that was at the little house, at the local houses, they accepted, they accepted the Gentile money, the stater that's in this story. They accepted the Greek money. They accepted it there. But up at the big house, they wouldn't accept it. And between the local house and the big house, they had to stop by the money changer. And they had to, ch they had to change that Gentile stater into two little Greek, I mean, uh, Hebrew half a shekels that the law required. That's all they took up there. That one was, was changed into those little half a shekels, and somewhere between the little house and the big house. You and I, Gentiles, that have been gathered in, yeah. we, we can't go like we are there, but somewhere between here and there, we're going to be changed. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Our, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his own glorious body. Amen. And Jesus said, Peter, go get the coin from the fish's mouth, and when you get the coin from the fish's mouth, it'll be enough for you and for me. One for you, one for me. One for Peter, one for Jesus. But by the way, look at them. Front and back, up and down, all around, they're exactly alike. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Amen. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen. 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 For we shall see him as he is. Amen. What a picture of salvation by the grace of God that's given to us here by that coin and that fish and that hook.